Hey, good morning, church. Good morning. Oh, okay, that was all right. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, just want to make sure we're a little bit awake. It is my honor to be here. If I don't know you, my name's Nate, and last week I started a four-week series on humility, and they let me come back for week two after starting off last week. Um, it is an honor to be here and to talk about the scriptures. Um, and I've got notes here, but it, it really struck me this morning as I look at my notes and the things that God's put on my heart and the scriptures um, that we're looking at this morning that uh, 20-something years ago, uh, Doug McBride led me through becoming what God intended. That study that Jerry just introduced for these young people, and I was probably roughly your age-ish, 20-something um, years ago, and I went through that book, and then I actually read Abba's Child um, with Doug McBride 20-something years ago. Um, and at that time period, God unlocked something in me of understanding who I am, of understanding how I'm loved, um, of valuing my emotions, and of valuing what was going on deep inside my inner life and my soul. And that thinking has propelled me for a couple decades to keep wrestling with that and learning more about it and reading more about it and to be able to teach and preach and be in other venues around the Bay Area and to talk about the deep love and mercy of God. And I could just talk about it over and over again. <laughs> just, just remind all of us how deeply we are loved and the grace that really is real and how that can form us from the inside out. Um, but this morning, as we talk about humility and as we talk about wrestling with who we really are with a sober judgment, I'm struck too that we need the Spirit of God to help us understand this. Amen? So there are some beautiful verses we're going to look at, some beautiful quotes we're going to look at from people wiser than me. But at the end of the day, we are trying to look at something deep inside our heart and deep inside our soul. So my hope is that the Spirit of God would speak to you. As we look at these scriptures, as we introduce these thoughts, that the Spirit of God would speak to you uniquely where you are at in life, and the Spirit of God would encourage you, and the Spirit of God would help show you who you are. So would you pray with me that the Spirit of God would help us this morning? Dear God, thank you for this church and the history here and the people here who love you and the people here who know that they are loved. And God, I do ask this morning... And God, I invite everyone to pray with me in this moment that your spirit would speak to us. That your spirit would nudge us and whisper to us and encourage us somewhere deep inside our heart and our soul about who we really are and how loved we really are. So God, we rely on you and we rely on your spirit, God, to move in this place this morning and to speak to each one of us, God. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to start out with a question, and I don't want you to answer out loud, although that might be fun, but I want you to just answer in your heart and mind, and here's the question. Who are you? Not, not your name, not how you look this morning, although you all look wonderful, right? Not what you're wearing, and not your title, and not your job, and not, not all that stuff that's a part of you. But could you consider for a minute, who are you? Like deep, deep inside, in your heart, in your soul, who, who are you? Think about it. Who, who are you? And how do you view yourself? The, the real you, the true you, and the real authentic you, do you believe God loves that you? Like the real you in your heart, in your soul, do you believe God loves that you that is really the real you underneath all the stuff? Do you believe God loves that true just you? And do you even believe that God likes that real you. 
Like, do you believe that God enjoys that real you beneath everything? That God actually wants to spend time with that real just you? Well, the short answer is yes. We can just go home now. But I want you to start thinking about it deep somewhere inside of you and talking to God about it. And I want to encourage you this morning in different ways from the scriptures that God loves the real, just plain, wonderful you and likes you and enjoys you and wants to be with you. Without any of the other stuff that you try to put on top and any of your accomplishments, that God enjoys just that real you, knows that real you and loves that real you. But the problem is for us, as we grow up in the broken world, we can lose connection to our own hearts. And we can begin to believe a lie that I have to be something else to be loved. I got to do something else. I need some kind of accomplishment or some kind of thing on top in order to be loved by God. I can literally remember my first lie I ever told. I was a very rule-following kid, so it was a big deal. I can vividly remember, like, first grade, if you did something really good in school and the teacher noticed, you would put a jar, you would put a pebble in a jar, and they would, like, celebrate you, and I wanted so bad to put a pebble in a jar. And I wanted to go home and tell my mom, and it didn't happen. So I would do good things so they would see it, but the teacher never noticed. So I went home, and one day I was talking, and I just said, Mom, I put, I put a marble in the jar. Because something inside little me thought, me's not good enough, but if I... But if, if I had that, right, if I did that really good thing, my mom would love me more, right? And I would, it, it would be okay if I did that thing. Like something in our younger years starts hitting us and telling us we got to be something else. Our true self is not quite enough. So we need God's spirit to remind us of who we are, to remind us that we are loved, we need God's spirit to help us see God accurately, to help us see the God who loves and adores us and enjoys us. But also we need the spirit of God so that we can actually stay connected to ourselves, to, to know who we are, the self who God loves. I hope you love these old quotes um, half as much as I do. But John Calvin, in this really, really famous book, like, talking about Christianity a long time ago. The whole beginning of the book is him writing about understanding God, knowing God, and knowing yourself. So he wrote, there is no knowing of God without a deep knowing of self, and no deep knowing of self without a deep knowing of God. Augustine wrote a prayer centuries ago, grant, Lord, that I may know myself, that I may know thee. And a, a current day pastor in New York, Rich Viotis, wrote recently, you can't know God deeply while being a stranger to yourself by not knowing who you are. I'm going to read this passage from Romans again. And many, I know many of you in this room have studied Romans intently, probably know it a lot better than me. But Romans lays out this beautiful teaching to help us understand the love of God, the gospel, the good news of God and how it works, and all the things that God has done for us. And then in chapter 12, there's a turn of sorts, where it's like, okay, like I laid all this out for you, so therefore, here's how you're going to work this out in community. Like, therefore, here, here's how this is going to play out together. So I'm going to read this again, Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned for as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. We're all different, 
So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This phrase, look at yourself with a sober judgment, is fascinating. It's also translated in other translations, um, sound judgment, or be reasonable in your judgment, or have wisdom in how you look at yourself. Have some wisdom and some sound judgment in how you view yourself. And the, the idea is not only not to think of yourself too highly, to be prideful or arrogant, but the idea is also not to berate yourself, to flog yourself and berate yourself and say, I am, a, you know, I am this and that and this and that. But it's to think of yourself with, with a level of honesty and wisdom. R Richard Foster writes about this idea of humility and knowing ourselves. And writes, the word humility comes from the word humilitas, meaning grounded or from the earth. Think of our word hummus, earth, soul. Hence, with humility, we are brought back to earth. We don't think of ourselves higher than we should, nor do we think of ourselves lower than we should. No pride or haughtiness, no self-deprecation or feelings of unworthiness, just an accurate assessment of who we actually are, our strengths and competencies, and yes, our weaknesses and our shortcomings. There's an old quote from the 15th century, humility is seeing yourself as you really are. It's that simple. That quote's 15th century that uh, Romans was written somewhere around the middle of the first century. But a, a fun fact, the first time I ever heard this idea that humility is seeing yourself accurately was my dear friend Rhonda Fury, who many of you know, a wonderful part of Creekside. I feel like there should be like a yay Rhonda moment right now. <laughs> I don't think she's here. But Rhonda, about 22 years ago, I literally remember Rhonda saying, you know what humility is, Nate? Humility is having a really accurate understanding of who you really are. And I remember thinking, I have never heard anybody say it that way. <laughs> I have never heard anybody say it that way. And I don't even know if it's true <laughs> or what that means, but that's super interesting. And I remember just that stuck with me, Rhonda Fury, quote, 20-something years ago. So Paul ties this idea of who we really are in Christ, and now we're in a community, and we have humility, and having a sober judgment, and he said, we all have different gifts. You all have different gifts. God has given you faith, and he's given you a unique set of gifts. Each of us, can you look around? Look around for a minute. Each of us in this room is a completely unique, special person who God created. And you are unique in how you were made and how God formed you. You are a unique human being in our midst. And God has given you certain gifts that you don't have and you don't have and you don't have and you have certain gifts that I don't have. You have a special you with unique gifts to use in the body. And I love how the, the end of that, of that passage talks about, and whatever gift you have, man, use it. Use it with zeal. Use it with joy. If your gift is giving money away, man, do it with generosity. If your gift is leading, do it with, with zeal. And some of us in this room have a pretty good understanding of what those gifts are. We've lived a while. We've wrestled with it. And we have a pretty good understanding of here's the unique gifts that God has given me. And some of us are still just trying to figure that out. We're still trying to figure out who in the world we are and what those gifts look like and what it would look like to use those gifts in the body with other people. But you, I'm gonna say this again, you have a set of unique gifts that only you have in just that way. Only in the whole world, only you have your unique 
set of what you can do, how God made you. I want to think deeper about how God made you and drive this home and look at Psalm 139. I'm just going to read part of it. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. God made you the unique you. And not haphazard, right? Not just randomly, you didn't pop up out of nowhere. These Psalms remind us that God made you with great care. Think about to whenever you were born. We were all born in very different years in this room. God, with great care, made you fearfully and wonderfully made. God created you. God put you into this world. You are fearfully and wonderfully made by God. But then, see, as we grow up, not all the other humans treat us like we're fearfully and wonderfully made, right? The other humans don't always treat us understanding, right, that the God of the universe created us fearfully and wonderfully made. And so we have these moments when it's like we don't understand if we are enough. The moments of criticism, the moments of being hurt, by other humans, the moments of being sucked into comparing ourselves to the other humans with the other gifts. And we can get sucked into thinking, if I was only more like that person, if I had their gifts, man, everything would be all right. If I was only had it together like that person, man, then, then I'd be okay. If I only had it a little more like that person and their gifts, then I'd be all right. People would like me more. It would be a better thing. We put on masks or things on top of ourself to be accepted and to be loved or just to be a little bit more like the other person in the body who has different gifts that we like more today. There's a quote by Thomas Merton. We insist on doing what is not asked of us because we want to taste the success that belongs to someone else. That moment of like, if I, I just want to feel what I think they're feeling doing that thing over there, and then I'd be okay. Instead of embracing the way that God has made you. Embracing your belovedness being you. I'm going to um, give an illustration just so you know, I try really hard in sermons not to reference basketball more than every other week. So this is my every other week where I get a basketball story, okay? So I just, I like literally try to measure it out. So I get to coach basketball a lot, as does our friend Irv here in the crowd and, and others, Tony Thomas, others. Um, but one of the things with basketball is it is really hard to help someone thrive on a basketball team if they are not self-aware. It is really excruciating to help someone thrive and become a healthy part of a team and to succeed if they don't understand what they're good at and they want to be good at other things. Like I coached a guy and I loved this guy and he was from my neighborhood in Oakland and I wanted to help him succeed and he's 6'9", 320, but he wants to dribble and shoot threes, which he's terrible at. <laughs> so what happens? I'm angry. <laughs> He's angry, the other coach is angry, his teammates are angry, right? He's not enjoying it, I'm not enjoying it. And I'm like, here's the reality. <laughs> the reality is, you are really good at this. You are stronger and bigger than anybody in this gym. <laughs> you will literally get a college scholarship if you will listen to me and do these things, because somebody needs you. But, if you don't want to do those things, if I want to be Steph Curry, <laughs> 
because that looks really fun. Like, Steph looks like he's having lots of fun. He's dribbling around and shooting threes, and everyone's cheering, and he's cute, he's adorable, and he's great. Like, we all love Steph Curry. <laughs> but you, you're not Steph Curry. But if you spend all your energy trying to be Steph Curry, we are all going to be grumpy. All of us. But if a team has a really good, accurate understanding of who they are, right? I'm really good at this, and you're really good at this, and I'm going to help you with that, and I'm going to help you. When you're slow and someone drives by you, I can come on the help side and help you. And when you come together and you're okay with who you are and the gifts that you have, oh, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. The same thing in us in a church. When we know that we're loved and we can embrace these specific gifts that we have, and look at the parts of us that are really hard for us and the things that we're not good at and look at that with sober judgment and ask God to help us and ask our friends to help us with the parts of us that are really hard for us in our lives. Things can be, work out really beautifully. I think a good example of somebody who was very self-aware and understood their role and understood what God was calling them to and was good with it was John the Baptist. People are running around, are you the Messiah? Are you the one? No, I'm not, actually. I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm not him. He knows he's not the Messiah. He knows who he is. No, I'm going to prepare the way. I'm a voice in the wilderness. I'm going to tell you to repent. I'm going to run back out there and put on some real wild clothing from animal hair, and I'm going to eat some honey, and then I'm going to come back and tell you I'm going to pave the way for Jesus. But even in the clothing and wild honey, he knew he was a prophet. He knew God has called me to be a prophet, and I'm going to dress in a way that correlates to the prophets of old. He knew who he was. He knew he was the guy who wore the weird clothes and lived out there, right, and had a following, but he knew it was all to point people to Jesus. He knew who he was, and he was good with it. And he did his role, I mean, beautifully, amazingly, and then pointed people to the true Messiah. So back to our original question. Who are we really? On one hand, it's a lifelong thing to wrestle with, to know ourselves, to know what's going on, to be connected to our own hearts. On the other hand, it's really simple. And you know this if you've been in this church. For those who have put, chosen to put our trust in Christ, 1 John 3, see what kind of love the Father's given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. Amen? Amen? It's the first thing about you when we trust Christ. You are a child of God. That's who you are. You are a child of the one who created everything and knows everything. You are a child of God, a dearly beloved child of a healthy father who loves you. And you are a unique child, right? That God made in a unique way. I was, last week I saw some old friends I haven't seen and, you know, you swap that thing. How are your kids and how are your kids doing? Oh, they're so big. Oh, I can't believe they're in college. I can't believe they're grown. It's fun. But one of the things when I talk about my kids more than like five minutes, and I can talk about my kids a while, like I, I like them, I like talking about them, is I end up saying they are three completely different people, <laughs> Like, they, are th they have three different sets of personalities, three different, I mean, totally different interests, totally different things they're into, totally different things that are hard for them, right? Totally different insecurities and faults and flaws and things that are really hard for them. It's all, it's three, it's totally different things. And sets of things that, help, that make them fly, right? Things that they can do in a special way, in ways that they thrive in their life. And you know what? When I'm in a healthy space, I love all three of them so much. So much. I'm not God, I'm not perfect. So my love has imperfections, right? They are so different. And you know what? Man, I love them with everything inside of me in their differences. And I even love them 
when those parts of their personality and who they are comes out that are hard and those things come up that are their shadow side or their sins, when those come up, man, I still love them. But what's nice to do as a father is when they start to see those things they're doing, right? They start to notice those points of incredible arrogance and rudeness to their father, right? (laughs) What's fun is when the kid can start to realize, oh, I just did that, didn't I? I do that to you sometimes, don't I? Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do that sometimes, and I still love you. But yeah, you gotta be aware that you do that sometimes. And now we can talk about it, right? And I can tell you I still love you when you do it, and now you can be aware of it, and now you can really grow towards something more healthy and good, because you're aware and honest about what's actually happening in your life and how you're acting out, and now you can even maybe learn why you're acting out, and you can pray about it, and you can talk to people about it. I have some, some closing thoughts. I was wrestling with how to land the plane on all these messages about humility. Because more than anything, I want the Spirit of God to help you go deep in your own heart and to wrestle with where you are at with God and to let God remind you that you are loved and to wrestle with what humility means deep inside of you. But there's three invitations that I wanna give you this morning. And the first is, they'll be on the slides, the first is, really the first leads into the next two, is that we need to develop the ability to hear the Spirit of God whispering to us. Because on this kind of topic, there are really good books, and there there are passages to read, but somewhere deep inside, you and I need to develop the ability to let the Spirit of God speak to us and be able to hear a whisper from God or a nudge from God, a moment with God where the Spirit speaks to us in a way that is true and real deep inside our heart and our soul, where we can hear that and respond to it and realize when God is talking to us. In that, on the next slide, is that we need silence and solitude in God's presence. Not out of duty. I am not saying you have to pray an hour a day so that you are a good person, so that God will love you more. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is you have a father who loves you, who would love to sit with you and help you figure stuff out. You have a father who loves you so much, who would love the space with you to remind you who you are. And I think there is something in the fact of Jesus in the middle of his ministry, leaving and going to the side of the mountain to be with the Father over and over. He had so much to do, so much important ministry, and he would just vanish and take off and be on the side of the mountain for the night just to sit with Abba Father. And there is something in that space alone with God where we can slow down and have a conversation with our loving Father and say, God, help me to figure out who I am. God, help me to figure out the ways I'm really messing up, and help me to figure out the ways I'm doing really well, and help me to figure out what you're saying to me. We need that space alone with God. And it might be on a commute, on a drive, and it might be on a walk, and it might be on a hike, and it might be in a closet, and it might be in a bedroom, and it might be in the backyard. There's all these places that could happen for you, right? I'm not saying you have to go find a mountain just like Jesus and sit on the side of the mountain. There are lots of ways people do this in creative ways, even in your workday. But where do you have space where God can even talk to you and remind you who you are? And the third thing I want to say this morning before we close in a moment is that we need the voices of others in the body of Christ to remind us who we are and help us work through the gifts and who we really are inside. God speaks to us through God's other children. Especially ones that we are close to and that we can be honest with and vulnerable with. So we need people who we can trust, who love us, who can help us, who we can talk about things and say, hey, I think God's saying this. What do you think? I think God's leading me here. What do you think? You know me. 
have this talk with Andrea every day. <laughs> hun, you know me so well. I think this, like, am I being, no, no, hun. Yeah, go do that. You're not being crazy today. Yeah. But you need some people in your life who you can share the real stuff with and they can encourage you and remind you who you are. Or when you're really insecure and you're having a really rough day of somebody that can say, hey, you're God's child. God loves you. You're going to be okay. You're going to be all right. So there's people that happens in an organic way or in you know, facilitated groups, but that happens with people you know. But I also want to add this. That also happens with people who are trained to do that, to do that really well, to help you understand yourself and encourage you. Whether that is a, a pastor right, or an elder or a, a deacon or a therapist or a counselor or a doctor or a spiritual director, but somebody who actually has, has worked on gifts that God's given them and has studied and has been trained to know how to sit with you and to help you process what God is doing. All those different humans can be really helpful to us. I'm gonna give you a couple minutes of quiet and silence. And I wanna ask you just to sit in God's presence. Maybe just to thank God that you are loved, first of all. Maybe to say, God, remind me that I'm loved. And maybe to wrestle with who you are and to say, God, remind me who I am. But I'm gonna give you a couple minutes just of silence, and I'm gonna trust that the Spirit of God can speak to you in a couple minutes of silence. So if you just close your eyes or whatever you need to do to take a breath and sit in God's presence and ask God to speak to you. Amen. We're going to actually close the service now. There's not another song, but I, I want to pray a sending prayer, a benediction for you, okay? And then we're going to go. God, would you remind everyone in this room that they were fearfully and wonderfully made? God, you knew everything about each one of us before we were even born. God, give us a confidence a confidence deep in our heart, in our bones, that we are so loved. The real, true us is so loved, so loved by you. And God, help us to hear your whisper. Help us to hear your spirit. As we continue to learn about ourselves and learn how to use our gifts and learn how to use our uniqueness in this world in healthy ways. But God, we know that you go with us as we walk out these doors. God, remind us that you are with us. Give us a sense of your presence and your peace as we walk out these doors in a few moments. Amen.